Today, we're going to take a detailed look at the Buninyong Gold Mining Company, as it was in the year 1864. For this video, I had the privilege of meeting with retired mining engineer Peter McCarthy, a renowned expert on both modern and historical mining. Peter has generously shared his fascinating insights into the machinery displayed on this beautiful old lithograph. So let's take a closer look. Here we have two views of the Buninyong Gold Mining Company, their number 3 shaft and their number 6 shaft. The above ground views here are fairly typical at first glance, but closer inspection shows a chimney coming out of the shaft at number 6, which is an interesting clue as to what lies underground. We also see capstans at both shafts, which are man-powered devices used for raising and lowering pump components. Heading underground, we can see men at work up in the old river gravels, removing wash dirt and lowering it to the reef drive using balance shafts. Horses are being used for haulage in the reef drives in both operations, but number 6 is employing another very interesting method, steam-powered haulage underground. This company installed a boiler and a steam engine underground to pump water and haul rakes of trucks. And as Peter will explain, it is a truly remarkable setup. Hi, uh, my name's Peter and uh, I'm a retired mining engineer and I'm particularly interested in the history of gold mining in Victoria, where I've spent a lot of my time working on various gold mining projects. Um, one of my favourite old uh, deep lead mines is the Buninyong Gold Mining Company. And the reason I'm so interested in that one is that the technology is particularly interesting and more advanced for the time than any of the other deep lead mines that I'm aware of. Uh, this property was bought in 1858 by the Buninyon Company for £20,000. So they must have expected to find a lot of gold. And uh, then by 1864, when this lithograph was created, they had an underground engine which operated uh, underground um, trucks that were pulled along by a continuous ropeway, which is an amazing thing. So um, if you look at the lithograph in more detail, it shows the uh, underground boiler. And uh, from the boiler, there was a, a quite a long smoke tunnel which ran as part, was divided off from the rest of the drive, all the way back to the shaft. Then the smoke went up the shaft and you can see in uh, the picture that there was actually a chimney inside the head frame and smoke coming out of the, the chimney. So that was coming all the way from the boiler, which is down in the reef drive. Having a boiler underground would mean that the smoke, the heat from the boiler and the smoke going up would have drawn fresh air down the shaft. So the ventilation would have been really good down to that point because there'd be fresh air rushing down the shaft feeding the fire and then being carried back uh, up as hot air and, and smoke. Um, but on the other hand, it's particularly dangerous because of course, if something went wrong with that system, then uh, you'd have smoke uh, in the workings and potentially people being asphyxiated by the smoke from the boiler. So they would have had to be very careful about that partitioned off drive uh, and partitioning in the shaft as well, because obviously if you have a, you've got a hot and very dry box in the shaft. So if someone threw a cigarette or whatever, or butted his pipe out on it, the whole thing could go up in flames. Um, so they'd have to be careful about that. And I know in, um, even in some of the projects I've worked on, when you've got ventilation into a timbered shaft, it dries out very quickly and you might have to put sprinklers on there to keep the, um, the, the timber all sufficiently moist so that it doesn't come apart at the joints and that it isn't a fire hazard as well. Um, I was told, and this is really not to do with this, but um, there's a sh the shaft, the prospector's shaft at Beringa uh, caught fire in the 1950s and because it had an adit going into the shaft and then the shaft came up from the adit, it was quite dry, the air had been circulating through it. When the shaft caught fire, but it was like a blowtorch shooting up several hundred feet into the air, this enormous blowtorch, uh, which only burned for a short period of time, like perhaps an hour or two, and the whole, the whole shaft, all the timber was burned out. So you can imagine just how ferocious that would have been. 
So that'd be the main disadvantage. And I guess the reason I know a number of the early Ballarat shafts in this era had a fire underground to promote ventilation, but it would have been a fairly risky thing to do, I think. <clears throat> the boiler operated a steam engine and that steam engine operated a bob pump, which kept the lower level clear of water. And it also operated a ropeway, which hauled a rake of trucks up and down an incline from the lower level. And it also operated, to me most interestingly, a continuous ropeway that ran all along the way along the main drive. And uh, along the main drive was um, uh, effectively a, a railway. Um, and at the end of a rake of trucks, there was a man on a little um, grip car and he sat there with a big pair of pliers and he'd grab onto one of the two ropes, depending which way he wanted to travel. And uh, that would the ropes would then drag the, the train up and down along the drive from the point where they were being loaded um, all the way back to uh, the cross cut to the shaft. So all of that technology was brilliant, I think, for 1864. And uh, perhaps it was too expensive because I don't know anyone else did it subsequently, but... Uh, it's a credit to the engineers involved, the manager, I suppose, uh, at that time that they were able to come up with all of this. I've been told that it's related to um, what they were doing in Scotland in the coal mines at that time, but I don't, haven't checked that and I don't know whether that's true. Um, but if you look at the, the, the thing in detail, you can see this is an end-on view of the, um, of the incline where they were hauling the, the trucks up and down with the steam engine. Um, on the lower level, they've got horses pulling rakes of trucks, which is more conventional, um, being loaded by, um, from a balance shaft. Um, and uh, that's, so they're working the gravel up here and dropping it down in trucks to the level below. Um, the underground pump is uh, a bob pump of the same sort that you would see at the top of most mines of that era. And uh, the steam engine drives through a reduction gear um, a crank. The crank goes around. Uh, coming off the crank is a horizontal beam and that beam uh, is connected to the apex of the, of the bob which pivots in the middle. It rocks. And uh, at the back end of the bob is a balance box so that they could add or remove material there to keep the whole thing in balance. And at the front end of the bob is a connection which runs down the shaft uh, made out of timber uh, all the way down to the pump and uh, this thing works up and down on a stroke of uh, depending on the size of the pump uh, you know five feet to ten feet sort of thing and um, so down at the bottom there's a pump and there are two types of pumps that they used um, one was used during the sinking phase which is simply like what you might call a a suction pump, uh, so there's just the one cylinder uh, with a non-return valve at the bottom and as the plunger goes up and down, it's like a stirrup pump or the old kerosene pump, uh, the water gets sucked up and then as it goes down it pushes it up the pipe. Um, but once they installed a permanent pump, there were actually two barrels to the pump and two valve chests and uh, the thing worked on a displacement system. So it's the weight of the wooden rods going down that actually forces the water up the shaft and discharges it at the top. So on the upstroke, all it's doing is lifting the, um, the, the, the series of pump rods uh, up to the top of the cylinder. And as that's happening, the water's gushing into the cylinder. And then the weight of the rods, once the, the other cycle of the, um, uh, of the crank comes around, uh, as it goes down, it displaces the water and the water goes up the rising main, which is a separate pipe. Um, the, the face of the two um, cylinders has a very large box uh, on the front with a whole lot of bolts or nuts that hold it on. And inside are the valves, the non-return valves that flap up and down and make the pump operate. Um, this was critical because obviously once the water is above the pump you can't fix it and uh, so there are lots of stories of um, mines where the pump failed for some reason usually it was the valve came loose inside and um, 
the water begins to rise. And while they've got bailing tanks and they can try to bail to keep the water down, sometimes the water's coming in faster than the bailing tanks can keep up with it. And there's a very limited time for the manager usually to go down there with spanner and an offsider and take all the bolts off the, the nuts off the front of the valve chest, replace the valve, put the valve chest back and get the whole thing going before they, you know, the water's coming up to their necks as they're doing it. There's one story of a particular mine where um, the manager actually had to go there and dive uh, and hold his breath and finish the job because the water was over his head by the time the uh, valve was, was repaired. So that would have been exciting, I'd imagine. <laughs> Um, with more examination of the thing, you can see all sorts of details about the way that they operated. And a lot of things on the surface are quite clear to see as well. Um, the usual things, the large uh, wood yard for um, feeding the surface boilers. So they must have also been taking a lot of wood underground to feed the boiler underground, which is an additional task for the shaft to be doing. And uh, you can see uh, in these views the the capstan, uh, which was primarily used to move the pump rods up and down in the shaft. And uh, the capstan was really a heavy lifting um, winch uh, with um, a, a number of um, arms coming out from the side so a team of men could walk around one way or the other. And it was tapered, uh, small at the top and big at the bottom, so that uh, if you were lifting something heavy, then the rope would go around near the top uh, if you're lifting something lighter, it would go down near the bottom. And in practice, uh, the rope started at the top, went down the shaft. So if you're pulling the pump all the way from the bottom to the top, as you went around and around, the um, rope would get further and further down the, um, the cone and therefore um, you'd get more uh, hoist out of a certain turn around by the men working. Uh, but of course, if you're pulling pumps or pipes out, you've got to stop and... Uh, unbolt them and take them out in sections. Nothing came out in a continuous run. Um, but that's the reason for the shape of those things and uh, the ropes just laid uh, in various layers going down. Um, you can see, the, as I said, the, the chimney coming out of the, um, the shaft and there's also two chimneys uh, which are from the processing plant and the, um, and the hoist as well. Um, Mullock heaps, the usual things, I suppose, on the surface. Uh, another interesting feature of this is that um, the stables for the horses are built above the level of the uh, reef drive. And the reason for that was that if there was an unexpected inrush of water, then um, the, the horses would be above the water level. The water might fill the reef drive completely, but the horses would be standing higher up and uh, would be protected there's also, uh, in this case, there's an air pipe leading in there and that's marked on the diagram. And uh, so they had a, an air pump or compressor on the surface and they could keep pumping air into there and so that would keep the water from rising any further into the stables and the horses might survive several days that it took to um, pump down the water level again uh, and get back in there. And so it was a, you know, a safety measure for the horses to have the stables above the above the rift drive. Another clever little feature of the whole design. The Bunanyong Gold Mining Company was under the management of Alexander Dewar, who was well known for his innovative approach to deep lead mining operations. Dewar had previously managed the old Gravel Pits Company, who were at that time the most technically advanced mine on the plateau at Ballarat. So it is little surprise that under Dewar's management, the Bunanyong Gold Mining Company became the most technically advanced mine in the whole Ballarat region. The Bunanyong Gold Mining Company operated until 1871, and as we have seen in this lithograph, they provide a brilliant example of the advanced engineering and technical innovations that really defined the deep lead mining era. Many thanks to Peter McCarthy for sharing his expertise and providing us with a detailed glimpse into this mine's remarkable operations. If you're interested in learning more about the fascinating history of the Victorian goldfields, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. You can also sign up as a member, where you'll get access to exclusive behind-the-scenes videos, sneak peeks, discounts and more. I'll put a link to the memberships page in the description below.